hello physicsers. Uh, see Carr here. Um, I want to just take a couple minutes to talk about uh, one of my favorite things uh, that also has so very much to do with the circular type motion that we've been studying, or it's at least really, really, really close to circular motion that we've been studying. There are a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap. Um, and I want us to think about uh, orbits of things. Um, and actually, my purpose here is going to be twofold, um, not just in this video, but over the course of the next, oh, however long we spend on this unit. Um, because I want to simultaneously uh, think about how do orbits work, and also I want to think about how is it that scientists change their views about the way that we think about nature. Um, as new evidence comes in, as new ideas comes in. How do we change our thinking when we do science? Um, and I want to sort of think about that in parallel with what do we know about orbits. And so I want to start off just by taking a historical perspective at what have people thought in the past about uh, the way that the universe works or the solar system. Um, once upon a time, there wasn't even a distinction about those because, well, if you didn't know that there was anything beyond our solar system specifically, then, or that there were multiple solar systems, then there's one universe and that's that. Um, but let's get on with it. And let's start with uh, somebody who I think you've heard of before, a gentleman by the name of Aristotle, uh, who is a famous uh, person of history. Um, philosopher, scientist, um, and he was Greek, um, and Aristotle gets the credit. Um, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure that um, this idea was all Aristotle's or any of his, but Aristotle's the one who gets the credit, so we'll go with that. Um, but Aristotle's thinking is that, well, we can see that all these things in the sky, in the night sky, we can see all these things moving in these arcs across the sky around the earth. And Aristotle's thinking, well, if the heavens were designed by the gods, well, then they must have chosen the perfect shape for these paths to follow. And the perfect shape is obviously a circle. Um, so the earth is a sphere at the center of the universe and everything moves around the Earth. And notice Earth, and then closest thing to the Earth is the Moon, and then Mercury, Venus, the Sun's way out here, yeah. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and planets beyond Saturn weren't known at the time. Uh, but for these things to move around the Earth, then, well, in our experience generally, when things are moving, they're moving um, like when they're following a very predictable sort of path and they're moving like on a surface. And so Aristotle reasons that they must be moving on something. Um, and so he imagines these uh, spheres, like these uh, celestial spheres, he calls them. But also since we can see through one sphere to see to the next one, then they have to be see-through. So they've got to be made out of crystal because, you know, crystals see through. Um, so Aristotle's imagining these crystal spheres that uh, various planets and sun and moon are moving on. Um, and all of that stuff orbiting the Earth. Um, there's a word over here that I want to focus on for a moment. Um, the word is geocentric. Now, that's probably a word that you're not already familiar with, but that word, we can piece together its meaning, and this, I think, is a really useful skill that goes way beyond being in this class or any one class. Just being able to think our way through what might a word mean. Maybe not nailing it down exactly, but at least really close. Um, and this largely works really well for words from Greek or from Latin roots. Um, like this word has a prefix, geo, a root word, center, suffix, ik. And if we can just think about those individual parts of that word, then we can come up with a pretty good sense of what does this mean. Now, the root word here, center, that one I think is self-explanatory, center. Um, but geo, 
we could think about what else has the word geo, what else has geo as a prefix, and what do those words have in common, and that can give us a pretty strong clue as to what does the word geo mean. Um, so I think about other geo words, geology, geography, geometry, um, and what those all have in common is that they're about earth. Geo is earth. Um, actually, fun fact, geometry um, literally means from Greek land measure. Um, but geo is a reference to the earth. Earth, center, this suffix ik just means like relating to. So this word, even without looking up a definition, I can tell that it's something about earth center. And that word does mean, uh, in this context, means that uh, we're looking at a universe that is centered around the earth. So the earth is at the center of the universe. So Aristotle imagines these things moving around these crystal spheres, perfect circular paths. Um, and then there's another sphere way out here um, that has uh, stars fixed in place on it. And so that whole thing rotates around the Earth. And that's why we see the stars appearing to move across the sky at night. Now, you probably have noticed by now that this doesn't really match up with the way that you hear people talk about the universe anymore. Um, because we've moved on since then. But this is a starting point. By the way, you might have noticed I mentioned Aristotle thinking of the Earth as a sphere. Um, and actually, a man by the name of Eratosthenes, who was an Egyptian, he was a Greek citizen, um, but he was an Egyptian uh, living in Alexandria, Egypt. I would hope that in other classes you've heard of the Great Library. The Great Library at the time was one of the world's greatest storehouses of knowledge. Um, so being the librarian at the Great Library is, you know, like, Eratosthenes was uh, one of the most knowledgeable people probably in the world at the time. Um, kind of a big deal to be in charge of the Great Library. But Eratosthenes, not only did he know how that the world was round, that the Earth was round, but he even figured out what the radius of the Earth is, or what the circumference of the Earth is. Um, this idea that Christopher Columbus is the one who shattered the, the idea of a flat Earth is just ridiculous nonsense. Eratosthenes, not only 200 BC-ish, Eratosthenes not only knew that the world was round, he could tell you what its circumference was. Um, which, Wow, that's impressive. Um, and, and the way that Eratosthenes did that doesn't involve any math more complicated than what you did in your high school geometry class, honestly. Um, actually, there is a video link right here. Um, you can type that in, or um, I will, uh, you can type that in to watch it yourself, or I will send you a link to that um, if you follow uh, wherever I post this video. I'll, I'll put the link there, but uh, this video uh, that I'm linking here uh, goes to uh, Carl Sagan, who's an astronomer who died before you were born, but he was famous at the time. Um, he actually did a show called Cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson a couple years ago rebooted that show, but um, there's a, a short video in which Carl Sagan shows here's how Eratosthenes knew that, and I very, very, very strongly recommend that you watch that. It's, it's good stuff. I like it. Um, but Eratosthenes knew not only that the Earth was spherical, it's approximately spherical, but he knew its radius, its circumference a couple thousand years ago. Good stuff. Um, now we're going to fast forward. We're on the AD side of things now to uh, another Greek, uh, Greek citizen, but living in Egypt. Uh, he was also from Alexandria. Um, this is Ptolemy, the P is silent, Ptolemy, and Ptolemy uh, also proposed a geocentric model of the universe, which again, geocentric, Earth-centered, uh, and Ptolemy, the reason why he updates our vision of what's the universe like beyond what Aristotle was thinking is because, well, Ptolemy also worked as an astrologer, 
and it was important to him to be able to work out precise locations, to be able to predict, you know, at midnight on June 27th, here is where Jupiter should be in the night sky, things like that. And so the, this model that Aristotle gave us didn't give good, correct mathematical predictions, and so Ptolemy was trying to come up with something that would work better than that. So that was Ptolemy's objective. Um, and so what he came up with, he wanted to keep the idea of circular orbits, but he added in something that we call epicycles. And again, here's a word with a prefix and a root. Now, cycle is a word that you, I would hope, recognize. Um, but this epi, um, epicycles, this is one that you probably wouldn't pick out on your own, but this essentially means like cycles upon cycles. And I'll show you what I mean by that uh, on the next page here. But Ptolemy's aim, because this is probably not going to make a whole lot of physical sense to you, his aim was to come up with something mathematically better. So what Ptolemy did, in order to be accurate and stick with circles, he had to add in these things again, epicycles, where as a planet follows this circular path around the Earth, then it also needed to follow a circular path around its circular path. Here, let me show you. Uh, I've got something right here that can kind of approximate that. Like, let's imagine that the Earth is right here at the center, and let's imagine that this little red blob of clay is a planet. Now, when I rotate this, then it's following two circular paths at once. You can see that this little stick here is spinning around in a circle while that whole thing is moving around the center. And so when I have two circles going on at once, you can see that that makes for a more complicated path. And so what Ptolemy did, done with that, what Ptolemy did was in order to make a better mathematical prediction, then he would just add an epicycle. He would take the circular path, add an epicycle, so now it's moving around a circular path while it's going around that circle. And he would just keep on adding epicycles onto epicycles until he was getting good mathematical results. And so here you see one with two epicycles, planets moving around this red path, while that red path is moving around the purple circle, while that purple circle is moving around the light blue circle. And this all seems ridiculous, but it worked. And as long as it worked to meet his objective, Ptolemy's objective of this can actually predict successfully where in the night sky things will be, it worked pretty well. And that's why we'll see where I pick up with the next video then we'll see a very, very, very long time passes between Ptolemy's work and the next thing that we see in the next video, which you can start whenever you feel like.